a testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission. Good morning, Aletheia Church. Happy Valentine's Day or International Singles Awareness Day. Got a lot of people that celebrate, huh? Then you have me who's been married for over 11 years, and my wife and I have never once celebrated this day. So, guys, get yourself a lady that hates this holiday. It's it's one of the many keys to success. Love you, baby. All right, now that I've gotten my banter out of the way, uh, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's where we're going to be uh, this morning. Uh, It's good to see you. Uh, Thank you for uh, being willing to... Uh, adjust with us and move inside. I believe um, the terrible thunderstorm is going to hit any minute now uh, this morning. So um, if we lose power, I'm going to go ahead and give you instructions now because this is an old building and it's possible if the weather does get bad that we lose power. Pull out your cell phone device, turn on the flashlight and point it up. And that's how we're going to get out of this building safely and sound. Uh, So if you can't tell, I had a dream about that last night that that happened to us this morning. So... For those of you guys that are Pentecostals in here, I don't know what that means, but um, so anyway, so our text this morning is going to build off of what we talked about last week uh, in those first nine verses of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so I want to give you just a a brief kind of uh, recap or review of what we talked about last week uh, so that if you were here, uh, this will be a refresher for you. If you weren't here, uh, you're going to get the brief Cliff Notes version and hopefully it's helpful uh, to you. Uh, But last week we talked about this call of God in our life to be distinct from culture. That what we see there in those first nine verses is is Paul in many ways attempting to uh, help us understand how he sees the church responding to the issues that we see in culture, but more importantly, inside the church. And so one of the things we see in those first five verses or so is that he, he lists a huge number of sins to be aware of both inside the church and outside the church. And kind of the warning he's giving there, these, these are our, uh, character things, things we need to be looking towards. And, and really the, the call of the church is to pursue behavior in accordance with God and his word. And the things listed here would be things that we would see in, uh, in, in rebellion of God and his authority and his word. And we even talked about how those various sins were broken up into categories, if you look at them closely enough. And they, they kind of start out innocently enough in the beginning. It, a, a love of self is often the, the motivator. But, but they move into various categories, which moves into then rebellion and then hostility and then hatred of God, that there just kind of tends to be this ever-progressing movement that sin ultimately kind of creates in us, where it creates kind of this attitude in this heart of love of self above all else and really hatred of God at the end of the day. And that's one of the reasons why we said this this list is something to be taken seriously, because that's what sin does. It kind of create, it, it creeps in deceptively, and before you know it, it's robbing you of joy and turning you against your Creator. And so, you know, Paul encouraged Timothy to be aware of the deceptiveness of sin, and then he moved into being on guard against that sinfulness, both inside and outside of the church. And then lastly, he, he, we finished off with this note of encouragement that he left him that ultimately God's truth prevails. And that one of the things we see is that even if you are in the midst of fighting for holiness and obedience in your own life, and you see people around you that appear to be thriving and uh, celebrating and enjoying life and, and living their best life now, or however you want to uh, term it, YOLO, you know, whatever the term is, I'm probably dating myself by using that term at this point, right? Whatever that, whatever that may be, that God ultimately has the final say. And that the folly of those who are in rebellion towards God and in rebellion towards his word, they get found out. That that all that ends up being shown in the end. And so last week we focused on that text more so internally. Right? I intentionally took that text and said, hey, I want us to turn this 
right, in and on ourselves. I want us to take this and take some time to examine this. I want to see how the text calls us to respond to this call to holiness and obedience in light of Jesus and what he's done. I want to see how this text calls us as the church to respond to that call, to be distinct and holy and walk in the world around us. But today, with last week's text as our foundation, we're going to see that Paul's going to move from laying that foundation on this idea of pursuing holiness and making much of Jesus with our lives to understanding that the things he lists in those first nine verses and the things he talks about in those first nine verses, that once we examine the church and are holding one another accountable and pursuing this life of godliness to make much of Jesus together, when we're doing that well as a church, then what we see in those first nine verses is our mission field. That that is who God wants us to go after. That the same way that God loves and redeems his people, and if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, that God has proven his love for you and the fact that he sent his son Jesus to die in your place and raise again from the dead, that as a church, as we celebrate that and per pursue holiness together and encourage one another and we weep with those who are weeping and we celebrate with those who are celebrating and we try to encourage one another and spur one another towards godliness, that as we do that as a church, eventually we move from that inward focus where we're only solely focusing on what's going on inside of our community and we're moving that outward, calling other people to the same freedom and life and hope that is found in Christ. And so we're going to see two things in the text this morning. That's it. The first one is this, that Jesus changes the lives of his followers forever, and that will inspire others to live on mission for him. That God uses the lives and testimony of others to point other people to Jesus. And the second thing we'll see is this, God's word is his gift to us to inspire us to follow him until the end. So I'm gonna pray that God would make this evident to us this morning, that we would leave encouraged and equipped and empowered to live for him. And then we'll start looking at the text. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, this opportunity this morning. God, I thank you for every man, woman, and child in this room this morning. I thank you that uh, they are not here by accident, that they are here because you love them and that you want to speak to them through your word. Lord, will you speak to our hearts this morning? Will you clear distractions from our minds so that we might focus on the beauty of your word this morning. God, will you renew our minds and lead us to trust in you more deeply and to obey you more. And may all of this be done not for our own pride or for the namesake even of this church, but may it be done to the glory of you and your son, Jesus Christ. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the men and women here this morning. We love you and I ask this all. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. All right, so first point we're going to look at this morning, uh, we're going to look at these first four verses, uh, starting in verse 10, uh, building off of what we saw last week. And I said, and I, I know that I tend to give you guys really long statements on what my point is, but you know, I've never been one to be able to simplify things. So just go, go with me and then come up later and tell me how I could have simplified it. But Jesus changes the lives of his followers forever. And they will inspire us to live, on, that will inspire others to live on mission for Jesus. And so look at verses 10 through 13 with me. You, and he's referring to Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. All right, so the first thing I want you to notice here 
<clears throat> right? And we've, we've talked about this a number of times, but notice, notice again Paul's tone here with Timothy, right? He's, he's really, in many ways, he's encouraging Timothy. He's like, Timothy, I just want to say this to you. Brother, you're doing a great job. Like, you are, you're following my example. You've, you've listened to what I've taught you. You've listened to the, the discipleship and, and what I've poured into you. You're doing great. Keep going. Like, keep pursuing that. And I think it, it, it's important for us, if, if, especially if you've been a believer for any extended period of time, for you to take a step back here this morning and just reflect a second on where you've come from and where God has you now. Because I think we have this tendency inside of the church, and some of it is good in the fact that we examine our lives and we see when it's not in line with Scripture and we become really hard on ourselves. Well, I, love, I love Jesus. I love what he's done in my life. I'm so thankful for him. And then I see this sin in my life and I hate it and I abhor it. And instead of you know, doing what God kind of encourages us to do in those moments where we, where we take a step back and we lay that sin at the foot of the cross and we, we trust that Jesus was sufficient to pay the penalty for that sin and we rest in that and then we repent of that sin and by faith we walk forward in obedience to Jesus, we instead kind of play this game where we start beating ourselves up. How could I possibly do that? And then when you add spiritual warfare to the equation, right, it gets even worse, right? The enemy will all, like consistently be throwing accusations out at you. Like, oh, you say you love God, but yet you live this way. You say you love God, yet you do this. And there's just this consistent pattern. And guys, Timothy clearly is by no means a perfect pastor. I mean, for goodness sake, he had two entire letters that were written to him that we have for sure that were preserved in Scripture, encouraging him on what he needed to do. Like we, we are the direct beneficiaries of some of Timothy's major flaws in character and uh, life. And yet you still see Paul, right, trying to remind Timothy, like, Timothy, man, no one's perfect. But I just want you to hear this. You're pursuing Jesus. Keep going. You're pursuing making much of him and leading other people to Christ. Keep going. Don't give up. Guys, so many of you in this room are young. Be a part of a community for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years that's going to do that for you. That's not going to let you skate by and view those sins even listed in the first half of chapter 3 as something that's not to be taken seriously and, and not something to care about, but it's also going to be like, keep going. Like some of the, the best, most godly advice I've been given in the last 10 years of my life have been when people sat down with me when I was just ripping myself to shreds on my failures as a father and having those men look me in the eye and tell me, yes, keep going. Keep going. Don't throw in the towels. Your sons need you. Keep going. Guys, this is Paul's call to Timothy. Yes, Timothy, you failed. Yes, you've made mistakes. Keep going. God's grace is sufficient for you. I see the way you're responding to God's word. I see the way that you've responded to my own life. Keep going. And guys, this is important. I mean, think about all that we know about Paul from the book of Acts. Right? If you look at Paul's life, right, his original name is Saul. And he's a religious leader, educated, powerful, and against Jesus and his church and everything they stand for. That's how he's introduced to us. As a matter of fact, when you see the first martyr uh, stoned and killed in Scripture, the ones who are stoning him lay their cloaks at the feet of this guy named Saul, who is Paul. He's, he is the one there that is overseeing this execution and approving of it. And his story is that he, his life is completely transformed when you get to Acts chapter 9 as he's on his way to Damascus to persecute and kill more Christians. He meets the resurrected Christ. Jesus just shows up in a blinding light and radically transforms Paul's life on the spot. He's, Jesus just shows up and is like, okay, you're done now. Time's up. And some of you guys in this room are like, yep, that's kind of how my life was. I was doing whatever I wanted and then Jesus just showed up and was like, you're done now. Time to follow me, let's go. 
For those of you guys that have had that experience, you, like, you know there's nothing else you can do. I always, like, people are always like reading through the Gospels and they see the fishermen uh, before they become disciples, right? And they're, they're out in the water and Jesus is like, hey, follow me. And they're like, okay. That's what following Jesus is like. <laughs> it, you, there, there's no like, well, Jesus, hold on a second. Let me think about it. No, he's just like, let's go. And you're like, yes, okay. It, it, let's, let's make it happen, right? And so Paul sees Jesus, meets Jesus, has his life transformed by Jesus. Then he joins the disciples. He studies for a while. He's equipped. And then he gives his life to preaching the good news of Christ and planting churches all throughout Rome. That's what the rest of his life is dedicated to. Huge transformation, right? He's the one that gets to share his testimony at the big church event. All right, those of you guys, like, I've always been a believer since I was three. You're usually not invited to share your story. <laughs> I'm going to share something with you guys in just a minute for those of you guys that that's your story, because I want you to hear something. So keep that in the back of your mind. But Paul's trajectory in life was drastically changed by Jesus. Right? He went from the most vehement enemy to the church and to God and to God's people to being one of the most important human figures in the early church. And yet as he writes to Timothy here and he says, hey, Timothy, I've I've noticed how you followed my conduct. I've noticed how you followed my teaching. I noticed how you followed my pattern in life and even my suffering and my persecution. He's not drawing attention to this so that Timothy will admire him. He wants Timothy to be encouraged because God has changed Paul's life forever. And it is a deep abiding worship of God inside of Paul that leads him to do all the things that he does. And he wants to encourage Timothy and know, Timothy, I know that that same motivation, the gospel, that drives me to go through what I go through is what's driving you as well. Stay in that. Stay encouraged. God has sustained me through so many things, and I see in you that same pursuit of Jesus. God will sustain you as well. Church, if you are a follower of Christ this morning, the same is true of you. That same God who sustained Paul sustains you as well. No matter what your circumstances are, he will sustain you through unbelieving family, unbelieving roommates, unbelieving friends, unbelieving bosses, unbelieving coworkers, and he will use your life for your good and his glory the same way that he did Paul. And yeah, you may not have that Acts 9 Damascus Road experience, but your story matters no less to God. There are stories in this church this morning of people sitting in this room this morning where their marriages have been saved by Jesus, where their families have been saved from self-destruction and sin because of Jesus. Some of you have battled drug and alcohol addictions and have been rescued and restored by Jesus. Some of you lived lives filled with pride and arrogance that made you unteachable and unable to even really be around people with any deep and meaningful relationships. You've been rescued by Jesus. No matter whether you have had some radical story like Paul, or you can't remember a time where you didn't believe and trust in Jesus. God's story of rescuing you is a miracle to be celebrated because he brought you from death to life. Those of you guys in here, by the way, just to give you guys, that, that my story is not the, hey, I knew Jesus from age three. It, 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 it was around age 21 that I came to know the Lord. I envy you guys. Some of you guys, like if you sit down and you heard my testimony, you'd be like, oh my gosh, Kevin, your testimony is crazy. You were wild. Yes. And it was awful. The amount of self-inflicted pain and self-destruction that God allowed me to place on myself was terrible. 
The amount of wickedness and things that I saw and had to be rescued from was terrible. And I pray every day for my sons that they have the most boring testimonies the world has ever seen. Yeah, dad was a pastor. We couldn't escape it. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) Praise God that he rescued you at a young age and glorify him and make much of him in that and worship him. And this isn't all, right? Many of us have now walked with Jesus for years in this room and seen him continue to sustain you and use you for his glory. And just like Paul, right, you have big moments in your life where you look back on and you say, God got me through that. And I don't know how anybody else ever gets through something like that unless they know the Lord. I think of, th- Paul shares three separate cities, right, in his example. Right? He shares Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And we're not going to look at those in depth, but if you want to go back later today and read what happened to him in those various cities, go read Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. Right? The narrative of what happens there uh, is, is what he's referring to. And when he arrives in Antioch, he does what he does when he goes to any new city to plant a church. He walks into the synagogue, he waits for them to finish their, their uh, ceremony, and then at the end of their uh, worship service, uh, the, the rabbi or the leader of the synagogue would stand up and say, hey, does anybody have a word of encouragement from the Lord for us? And Paul would immediately stand up and share the gospel. That was his, his method. He'd walk in and be like, yeah, y'all need to follow Jesus. You're close, but you're not quite there yet. And he would share the gospel with them. right? And some would, every city, this was the story, Some would respond, some would reject him, and the longer he stayed there, the ones that rejected him would eventually throw him out of the city. So he he arrives to Antioch, and they drive him out. So he just moves on to the next city. He's like, well, I'm going to go to Iconium now. Here we go. Similar story, except this time they try to stone him. God lets him know that this is going to happen, and he leaves, right? And you guys are thinking at this point, oh, this is so great. Like, God's like protecting him, right? We'll wait until he arrives in Lystra. He heals a paralytic man, shares the gospel, and he's picked up, taken outside the city, and stoned to death. It's, it's as he saw the faithfulness of God, God allowed him to suffer more and more progressively, city after city after city. You know what happens at the end of that, that story in Lystra? After they presume that he's dead, they, they, they pick up their cloaks and they head back into the city and his disciples go and pick him up. And he stands up in the next day and says, all right, we got to go to Derby. You got to plant a church there. I can't imagine what he looked like, but he, it probably wasn't great. I'm looking sharp this morning. I know. <laughs> Most Sundays, not so good. Paul probably was not like the supermodel you would want of heading into a new town to plant a church. And yet he says... God has transformed my life. I went from killing Christians to nearly being killed for one, and I will continue to share the gospel until my last breath on this planet. He says to Timothy, Timothy, God saved me. He changed my life. He has sustained me and empowered me in my ministry. And as I've seen him put to death sin in my life, Timothy, he's doing the same thing. In you, keep going. Church, he's doing the same in us. Let's keep going. And let's look to the lives of our brothers and sisters around us as they share stories of victory of what God's doing in their life. And let's celebrate lives being changed by Jesus in our midst. I mean, even in the last six months, right, as COVID has raged and, and around the world, and we've been trying to figure out how to live in the middle of a global pandemic. I've seen God reconciling people to families. I've seen people overcoming sin and putting it to death. I've seen people walking with Jesus for the first time and being baptized, not because of us, but because of how God is using us to make much of him. And Paul's call to us, Aletheia Church, is keep going. Keep going. God is at work. Keep repenting of sin. Keep placing your faith in Christ alone. He has changed our lives and he will continue to do so. 
And as our lives are changed, they are used by God on mission to inspire some to follow after Jesus and some will reject us. That's what we sign up for. If we want to live a life on mission for the Lord, some people's lives are going to be radically transformed for eternity because of your faithfulness. Then some people will reject you and ultimately Jesus. That's how it works. I don't share that with you to scare you. I share it with you because it's reality. And sometimes things become a little bit easier to handle when you know what's coming. I'll never forget a story like one of my first years here at UF. We'd been in the city maybe for, I don't know, six months, and I was meeting with a student the first week of classes his, the, that fall semester. And he meets me at the rights. This is before they had redone it, and it looked really nice like it does now. And I sit down with him, and he just has this look of just pure shock and fear on his face. And I'm like, hey, man, like, how you doing? Like, what's going on? He's like, I'm done. I was like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> what happened? I'm expecting, like, some major story. He's like, I just got out of my physics 2 class. I'm like, oh. I, I heard one person go, oh, someone knows. I was like, well, what happened, man? I'm like, what in the world could possibly happen in the first day of class? <laughs> To have you in that much fear. And he goes, my professor walked in and there was like a hundred of us. And he asked, he said, who here is a physics major? Raise your hand. He's like, there were three people. And then he said, for the rest of you, my goal will be to fail you this semester. Good luck and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. I was like, oh. I was like, well, now you know what you have to do. You have to try to overcome what he's trying to do in your life. And he did it. He buckled down, he studied hard, he went to class, he did what he needed to do. Sometimes just knowing what we need to do, knowing what's in front of us, right, is what is promised to us, right? And consistently we see this from Paul, right? You're going to suffer. Some will respond. Some will reject. Keep going, Jesus is worth it. Keep going, church, Jesus is worth it, right? And look what he says in verses 12 and 13. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will what, church? Be persecuted. This is why I never understand people that like join a church and claim to be a follower of Christ and then when life gets hard are confused. It's like, God doesn't lie to us. He's like, hey, Jesus is your savior and your, and your king, and he offers you forgiveness of sins and love and a family and identity, but he also promises you that in this life, it's going to be hard. Like, as a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say, when you read verse 12, if you desire to live a godly life, you should see increasing levels of persecution, not decreasing levels of persecution. It's, just, it's almost as if in the original language there, the assumption is the closer you grow to God, the more you will feel alienated and hostile in this culture and in this world. That that is the assumption that God has given us. Every one of us will be persecuted if we are a follower of Jesus. And Paul's message to Timothy is this. Timothy? It's worth it. Jesus is worth it. He's worth being made fun of by your coworkers. He's worth being teased about and misunderstood by your family members. As like very few of us in this room will ever be beaten for our faith. There's that famous passage in Acts where John and Peter are beaten by the Sanhedrin for sharing Christ. And Gamaliel stands up for them right beforehand and says, like, hey, if you guys try to stop them, like, if this is God, like, you aren't going to be able to stop it and you're going to create more issues from yourself. I would just say, be done with these guys and let's see what happens. Obviously, you guys this morning are an example of what happens. God's behind it. But then they beat them, and it's fascinating. They walk out of their beating, celebrating, saying, God, thank you that you considered us worthy to suffer for your name. That's not meant for us to read that and say, I'm terrible. Like, I hate being teased. No, it's to encourage us. It's to encourage us and say, Lord, build me so that I can get to that point. 
build my life with such fervor and with such a deep love for you that I'm willing to do that. Church, what motivates you to live for God? Ask yourself that question. What motivates me to live for God? What motivates you as you sit here this morning and you see that Paul says to us, you will be persecuted if you are a follower of Jesus. What will motivate you to keep going? In the last 10 years of ministry, right here, there, there's a consistent theme that I've seen in my life and the life of others. We often know persecution is what is coming. We often know like suffering might be something that we have to face at some point in time. And yet, when we fail, we become paralyzed. We get weak knees and we don't know what to do and we're struggling and we're, and we're just like, ah. And every single time, both in my life and the life of others that I've had the privilege to pastor and know as they've walked through that, in the midst of that failure, usually what's, dri what's driving them to live a godly life is the wrong motivation. I ask them, like, hey, what, what, so what, why, why are you trying to overcome this sin? Why are you walking through this persecution and yet failing consistently in your, in your own opinion? Like, why is that? And it's like, I want to be a good believer for Jesus. I want to be the best Christian I could be, whatever else. And, and I would say, like, at face value, that sounds so amazing, right? Like, I want to be the best believer. I want to be on fire for God. I want to have this faith that can move mountains, right? I want to do all these things. But your motivation is self-centered. And eventually, you make a terrible God. And you eventually decide, I'm not worthy of following. The people that I've seen face the deepest valleys of their life and come out the other side stronger and more fervently in love with Jesus are motivated by Jesus. They're motivated to walk through the storm, to walk through the suffering, to walk through the persecution because of Jesus, not because of their own reputation or their own performance as a Christian. That song, He is Worthy, that we sing here regularly and that, we sing, that we'll sing today, Right? That's what we're after. Jesus is worthy. He's the pearl of great price. He's the treasure hidden in a field. The man who will sell everything he has so that he can buy that field and go after it. Guys, that is what Jesus is. For those of you that are celebrating Singles Awareness Day today, Jesus is better than a spouse. Jesus is better than a family with kids. He's better than the American dream with a stable job and a stable retirement account. Jesus is better than your health and your wealth and your prosperity. And that's why Paul, towards the end of his life, is able to say something outlandish, like for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because he consistently pursued nothing other than the glory of his Savior. Church, in our lives, in our suffering, and in our testimony, if Jesus is the firm foundation of our motivation to do anything, to work to the glory of God, to live to the glory of God, to play intramural sports to the glory of God, to parent to the glory of God, to be married to the glory of God. That is a successful life. That is a life worth living. Because I always am teetering on, on the edge of, I really want to be a good husband, and I can't be a good husband unless I die to self and live for Christ. Because the moment I run to performance and being a good husband, guess what happens? I fail. 
even if I succeed, I fail. Because it becomes about me and not the glory of God. And yet Paul takes a step back here in this passage just to remind us. Jesus is bigger than all of this. And he waits there, calling you, follow me, seek, you will find, knock, I will answer, because I am worthy. And as we live that out, and we do, we, we, we live out that tension of dying to self and living for Christ. Those of you guys that came to Christ later in life, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. That's what makes Jesus look glorious. As I watch people walk through some of the deepest valleys of their life and Christ be enough for them, I couldn't turn away no matter how intellectual I wanted to get. Right? Like, guys, hear me out on this. I love apologetics. I love them. I read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity every year for fun. I've read it for 16 years, and some of you guys are like, that's a, kind of a hard book to read. Yes, I love it. Apologetics are awesome. C.S. Lewis is smarter than you and me. It's great. I've never seen a heart turn from stone to flesh by meeting, reading Mere Christianity. But I have when they respond to Christ and what he's done. Guys, that's the God we serve. And yet, while we, while we pursue that as a church, some will reject it. Right? He, he says to Timothy right, in verse 7, excuse me, in verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Like, guys, just be ready for it. You're going to feel like things are terrible and you're going to feel like the worst people in the world are succeeding. Just be ready for it. Ultimately, right, verse 9 of last week, they're not. God will have the final say. Seeing people reject Jesus and his mercy is heartbreaking. I get it. I've seen it now for 16 years. Don't let that deter you. The gospel attacks the false motivations of our lives, but as Jesus is the motivation of our heart, and people see that consistent testimony in your life, they will be forced to respond to it. And some will follow him, and some will reject, but Christ is still king. Our lives and our testimony thereafter collectively inspire us to worship and make much of Jesus so that we might display him to those who don't yet know him. Guys, don't be ashamed of your life. The good and the bad are being reconciled by him to make much of your king. Embrace it. He is worthy. Now, not only does God want to use us our lives as a testimony to his grace and mercy. But he also gives one other gift to us. Look at what Paul says to Timothy, starting in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred, sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, so he starts off by saying, continue in what you have learned and believed, Timothy. And where is that? Or he calls it the sacred writings. Because he says they are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus. And he says, Timothy, when you're in the pit, in the valley, 
and you can't see clearly, run to Scripture. Run to God's Word because it is the anchor for you when everything is chaotic around you. He says, we're both inspired as followers of Christ by the lives of those around us and their testimony of what God is doing, but also by God's word. I think one of the funny things here is I've had some people over the years, like they'll, before they visit Aletheia, they'll hop on our website and they'll always click on that About Us section at the top. And under that, like our mission and values are listed. And one of the values that's listed there is the Bible. And people are going to like, why do you have the Bible listed as a value? This is why. Because there are churches, guys, out there who think what their pastor says is more important than what the Bible says. Guys, you don't need my opinion. I can assure you from the 20 plus years that I lived apart from God, you don't want anything I have to offer you on my own. Unless you are looking for hardship and self-destruction, then come and ask me. I, can, I have plenty of tips for you. Plenty of really, really good, bad advice. But you don't, you don't want what I have to offer you. Guys, what Paul is saying to Timothy here, he said, Timothy, when you read the sacred writings, when you are reading scripture, God is speaking to you through his word. He is revealing himself. He is revealing his son. He is revealing your sinfulness. And he's revealing to you God's plan to reconcile all things. The Bible is not a bunch of disjointed books that just somehow got thrown into an anthology together. It is an unfolding story of God's love for his creation and how he ultimately rescued us through Christ. And guys, one of the most encouraging things I think you could ever see at some point in your life is as you read the Old Testament and you study it, you start seeing Jesus peppered throughout it. And if you want help doing that, go read the book of Hebrews. They will tell you all the places you can cheat and use cliff notes to go find them in the Old Testament. It's beautiful to like read the life of Moses and think that the Jewish people have this amazing view of Moses. And then Moses at the end of his life is like, yeah, God's sending one better than me. Hey, to see Israel wrestle and struggle through terrible King Saul and to get King David and be like, that's a man after God's own heart. I love that guy. And God's like, yeah, the line of the Messiah is going to come through him. The King of Kings is going to come through his line. It's going to be far better than King David. Right, over and over again. Even, I mean, Hebrews even breaks down how the, the tabernacle and the sacrificial system in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of Christ and what he's done for us. Guys, Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament because the book is about him and what he's done for us. And Paul says, Timothy, run to that. When you are weary and in need, God will meet you in his word. Right? He says in verse 16, to encourage Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I mean, think about the language. He's like, he's like, all right, first of all, Timothy, as you read the scriptures, right, even if people are pushing back at you, remember, that was God's design and words inspired and given to regular men. Remember that. It was breathed out by God. And then not only that, that word is profitable for teaching, meaning it's something you should actually use as a standard. That it's good for anyone that hears from it, whether they reject it or not, it is good for them. It is profitable. And he says it is good for reproof. It means it's shown how something is proved, right? Math majors in here know exactly what a proof is. I always love, like, you go to elementary school and they say two plus two equals four, and you're like, okay, and you just believe it. And the math majors are like, prove it to me. And then they'll do equations that would stretch across this entire stage to prove something. And they're like, okay, I believe you now. Paul's saying that's what God's word does to unveil to us that Jesus is who he really said he is. 
that he is God's rescue plan for humanity. He says that God's word is for correction, meaning, meaning it fixes wrong behaviors and beliefs about ourself and God. And then ultimately, and I love this line, for training in righteousness. Notice how he doesn't say, for you to live perfectly in righteousness. Now, what's the word that Paul uses there? Training. Guys, your life as a follower of Jesus is you training in righteousness. So when you look at your life, you're like, I'm not perfect. Yes, because you aren't Jesus. But in Christ, as you live a life more and more in obedience to him, going to his word to be trained, to be reproved, to be corrected, to receive profitable teaching. You are training in righteousness for godly behavior to the glory of God. Brothers and sisters this morning, what will be the authority in your life? What will have authority in your life? What will be your source of truth? Will it be people? Will it be a political party or ideology? Will it be the news? Will it be academia and science, philosophy, sports, entertainment? Or will it be God's word? What will you surrender to as the authority of your life? Like I said earlier, we teach the Bible line by line here because that's what we all need. You don't need Kevin's opinion, Daniel's opinion, Theo's opinion, Derek's opinion, Stephen's opinion. We need God. We need his word to us so that we can follow him as he desires. Church, if we will take Paul's encouragement here seriously, look at the promise he gives us if we'll pursue God's word as our authority and anchor in life. Look at verse 17 that the man of God, just so you guys know, ladies, that word man there is the Greek word anthropos. It's a gender neutral term. It means humanity. So he's not just talking to the dudes in the room. So that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Guys, that's God's promise to us that if we'll run to his word, that if we'll cling to it, that if we'll seek our hope and our satisfaction in him, that we will be brought to completion, equipped for every good work. As you know, do you know what your desire should be as a believer? To finish well. On, on your deathbed or whenever your final day on this earth is, right, to be there and to say, I've run the race, I have finished, I'm ready to go be with Jesus. That's the goal. Not a perfect life. Not a sinless life. A life that finishes well abiding in Christ. Church, God's word will lead us to completion, equipped for every good work. It's where we go to learn discipline, where we go to learn to suffer well for the glory of God as we follow the examples of others before us. It's where we're taught to learn how to love others because we don't know that naturally. We just don't. It's where we go to be taught and encouraged how to share our faith with others who don't know the Lord. It's where we go to be equipped on how to have a godly marriage and raise children and work to the glory of God, to have friendships that make much of Jesus. God's word teaches us how to do all of these things. 
No, it doesn't teach you how to do open heart surgery. But it does teach you how to be a compassionate open heart surgeon. No, it won't teach you how to be a mathematician. But it will teach you to be how a godly man or woman who is a mathematician. But we must be going consistently to the word of God every day, dining at the buffet of his word as we consume it. Guys, let me just share something with you. And I wrestled with whether I was going to make this point or not because I, I think it's going to come across as maybe a little harsh, but I think it's also reality, and so I feel called to share it. Every one of you in this room, myself included, are being discipled every day by something. By podcasts, by books, by articles, by movies, by music, by television shows, by the internet, by YouTube. I, the list is endless. You are being discipled every day by someone or something. Every day of your life. And yet consistently, consistently, I see this in my own life and I see it in other people in our church. We give God and his word just the most minuscule amount of attention we could possibly give it. And then we fail to understand why all these other things are having influence and sway over us. This isn't me saying like, hey, here's a direct formula on how much time you need to spend in God's word and exactly what it needs to look like and you need to delete your YouTube account and cancel Netflix and all the things that would be really, really easy answers. Those aren't, those aren't the answers, guys, because you'll just run to something else. No, the harder work is to take a step back and say, how am I being discipled and how is it not being done by God's word? How will you examine my heart? Will you give me wisdom to see how I'm allowing these things to control my thought, to control my mind, to control my mood, to control the, the energy I will give it? And if it is not in, your, in line with you and your word, Lord, will you please grant me repentance so that I might follow you and make much of you? Right, Paul says this in his letter to the Romans in Romans chapter 12. And look at what he says. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And look at this part. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I would be a rich man, financially speaking, if I had $20 for every time I sat down and had a conversation with somebody who's really, really struggling with something, and as I'm processing through what they're working through, they're being discipled by something other than the Word of God. You know, they're in this conflict with their roommate, and they listen to that lady on the radio who gives relationship advice, even though she's been divorced seven times. She seems really sweet. I mean, she's got a great radio voice. She's not your source for authority, guys. They're going through financial hardships and, you know, they're solely listening to, you know, some podcast or Dave Ramsey special. Some decent advice there. Dave Ramsey's not the word of God. They see hardship in their community in front of them or whatever else. And instead of running to God and his word and what God asks of us to serve the lowly and oppressed, they run to what a political party says is the best answer. And then they fight with other people about it. Because I had a conversation this past week with somebody who was like really, really upset about everything going on politically, and I stopped him about 10 minutes in, and I said, God, I, if you want to talk about this, I, I, can we just stop? Can I leave? I, hear me when I say this. I love this country, and I love America. I've told you guys before, my favorite commercial ever is the commercial of the Dodge Charger with George Washington riding in with the American flag. It's awesome. Right? Being American is kind of cool. It's nothing compared to the kingdom of God, guys. I just don't care. Like, if America falls tomorrow, guess what stays around? 
God and his word. And I'm not going to lose my salvation and my soul seeking after something that's not worthy. And I refuse to allow myself any longer to be discipled by it. And so by God's grace, by his mercy, knowing that I'm forgiven and loved already because of what Christ has done for me, I'm going to repent and seek God through his word, not through other things. And this is God's call to us as well. That we renew our minds consistently through the intake of God's word. Knowing that his word is his gift and encouragement to us through persecution and suffering. To see his promises to us. and To see his faithfulness to see how he has saved us and how he will sustain us in all things, to teach us to practice righteousness and to see us brought to completion, equipped for every good work. Let's think about that promise. God is saying to you, right? You're like, I want to be a good Christian. Here's the solution. It's right here in his word to know and follow Jesus and put your faith and trust for him, even your desire to be a good Christian, outside of yourself and in him instead. And so here's how I want to close our time this morning. Right? As we have an opportunity to think through this and respond through this, right? I want to read Acts 1:8 to you. I've been reading this to you consistently because I love this verse, right? I love how Jesus is both giving a command and a promise in this verse. I love it. So beautiful, and it's a beautiful display of the heart of God, right? As he both gives a command and then promises that he will fulfill it in us. It's amazing. Look at what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That is why we're still here, guys. Church, that is why we exist. This is God's call on our lives, but it is also God's promise of what he will do in us. To be his witnesses, both through our testimonies like Paul and through his word. God will reconcile and change the world that way. This is why, you know, and Daniel was talking about this a couple weeks ago, why we love the one campaign here, and we'll probably do it for forever, at least as long as I'm here and alive. Who do you want to see transformed by Jesus? Ask God to use your testimony your story of a transformed life to lead others to him. Ask God to use his word to equip you for every good work so you might see your friend, your family member, your one know Jesus. This week in gospel community, or if you're in a campus Bible study, lead and ask these questions. But share with them how God has changed your life and how you believe God wants to change the lives of those you're in community with. And then commit to being in God's word. Some of you guys don't know this, right? Our church does a community reading plan for the Bible yearly, right? If if you're like, I really struggle to be in God's word, stop at that back desk after, after service today and pick up one of the community Bible reading journals. It's, in my opinion, the best reading plan out there, but it's because it's the one I do. And if it doesn't work for you, find one that does, but be in God's word consistently. We'll have journals back there. There'll be someone back there to explain to you how you can get in the group me and be receiving other people's daily encouragement of how God is speaking to them in his word. But the whole goal of that is that we are, as a community are reading God's word more and more, being renewed in our mind so that we might be equipped for every good work. And may this 
inspire us for mission so that more people might come to know King Jesus because he's worthy. A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel like the death and race to walk in newness of life.